we are reading a phenomenal book by Nedra Tawab called Set Boundaries, Find Peace, A Guide to Reclaiming Yourself. And also, if you want to get this book, you will see the description below. Um, and you'll be able to get from Amazon as well in the description or in the comment section. So this book, my wife and I, we do a lot of reading or at least when we can, as much as we can. But I think this is something that has drawn us closer together over time. This is somewhat of our bare rock foundation of when we started dating. And you can watch one of the videos on that about how we started when we were dating long distance type. Uh, but this is something that we continually do on a regular basis. So this is our book. And I challenge all couples this year to uh, deeper your intimacy through taking some time to read uh, together. So, yeah. So overall, what did you think about as we read in the inter introduction and uh, even in a preface? Because when we do our reading, we highlight Mm -hmm. We read the chapter, we highlight, and then we come back to discuss what was highlighted. Yes. And it gives each other a chance to uh, express themselves. You find out that much more about your spouse, your significant other, through what they highlighted through the book. So as we continue to talk about the first two chapters, what did you think so far uh, was there anything that you saw in the preface or in preface or preface, preface or preface, <laughs> wherever you're from, you know, I'm from Ohio. So, uh, yeah. So was there anything that you saw in the preface in the or in the, preface, in the introduction? Uh, in the preface, I highlighted in the past, I carried around a lot of resentment, hoping that others would guess my mood and wishes through trial and error. I've learned that people will not guess my needs. They went about their day while I suffered in silence. I know that there are so many times where I would just hold, I would, I did it with you. I was sit there and hope that you would just know what I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And I just assumed that you should know how I feel about certain things instead of me actually voicing it. Mm -hmm. And even through counseling, my counselor would always tell me, well, how would he know if you didn't tell him? And I'm like, he should, I'm, I look upset. He should just know that I'm upset. And I realized later that that wasn't fair to you. So when she said that, um, I was like, oh yeah, I do that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just in the, in the preface. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what did you have highlighted and on the next page it says it took me years to not feel as guilty setting limits with others because i didn't know that guilt was normal when you're doing something that you believe to be mean mm -hmm. yeah that's true yeah but she, she said it took me years to not feel guilty for setting limits with others and I think that's the thing. Sometimes I think we feel that if we set limits and boundaries with others, we might lose people in a turn. Yeah, for sure, for and, sure. And she talked about that later on in the book as well. But I think it's important that it's okay to set boundaries. It's okay to take that time to let people know that this is where I stand. Mm. And those who rock with you, they're going to respect it anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think those who might not really be for you that's when they get that that's when they get frustrated yeah. because they like oh you changing now or oh, you different now oh, yeah. <laughs> you know uh, and she says to believe to believe is to be mean and it's not me yeah yeah it's not well you feel mean though initially because it's like when you're having to tell people no or you know you you do feel mean saying those things to people it's like oh yeah they heard a thing from me and you think mm -hmm. you know you feel guilty about doing those things so. mm -hmm. I, I I know I felt I felt that way in the past for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. By telling people no, because I feel like oh they need me, so I have to do this. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. mm -hmm. No, I get it. Just feelings being validated. No, I get it. Mm -hmm. Uh, where did you have an introduction? I didn't actually have anything highlighted in the introduction. Did you? I didn't have anything. And oh, actually, I did. I had some stuff in the introduction. Okay. Yeah, uh, where she says clarity. Clarity saves relationships. Mm, 
Mm-hmm. And I thought that was good too. And like you said about being in your head and expecting, you know, me to know. Yeah. Like she says, clarity. When you're clear, it helps save your relationship. Yeah. When, when you're clear. Are you a content creator, YouTuber? Maybe you've interviewed someone on your video podcast and they said something that was really, really good. Or maybe you said something that was really, really good. Well, enter Opus Clips. This is the platform that I use when I want to share 30 to 60 second video clips that I can share with the whole world. I mean, you can share those clips on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram Reels, like these 30 to 60 second clips that Opus Clips can give to you with the click of a mouse. All you have to do is upload the recording and boom, Opus Clips within maybe 10 minutes will give you 15 to 25 different clips with description on the side of the video. And it also gives you like a title and it gives you a rating and lets you know how powerful that clip can be used on social media from a rating of 99 all the way down to maybe 60. This is a phenomenal platform that has took my social media marketing to another level. If you want to level up your social media game, go in the description below right now and get the link for Opus Clips. This will not disappoint you. Because you set that boundary and we know we both know our expectations. Right, right, right. And she also, I thought this was good. She says, reasons people don't respect your boundaries. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and she has bullet points. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> She says, you don't take yourself seriously. Mm-hmm. You don't hold people accountable. Mm. You apologize for setting boundaries. Mm-hmm. You allow too much flexibility. Yeah. You speak in uncertain terms. Mm-hmm. I, I, I know I've been guilty of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you haven't verbalized your boundaries and they're all in your head. That's just what I'm guilty of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, all right. You should just know that I don't like it when you do this. Mm-hmm. Right. That's not fair. Yeah. And you can't hold someone accountable for something that haven't been discussed. Mm, that's good. Yeah. So if you're having those conversations, you mad, but you never discussed it. You know? Okay. It says uh, you assume that stating your boundaries once is enough. Mm. And she says, you assume that people will figure out what you want and need based on how you act when they violate a boundary. That is me. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That was a good. Yeah. That was really good. Okay. Um, so what did you have in the first chapter? Mm-hmm. First chapter is what the heck are boundaries. Boundaries are the gateway to healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. So in the first chapter on page six, where she says the root of self-care is setting boundaries. Okay. Then like the last sentence in that first paragraph, Mm -hmm. she says, if you think about it, the root of self-care is setting boundaries. It's saying no to something in order to say yes to your own emotional, physical, and mental well-being. Yes, that's good. Um, yes, I, I thought that was good because we we'll only we all have a certain amount of hours in a day. Yes, and like she says, if you say no to something, then that means that you can say yes to, like she said, whatever you got going on emotionally, no. physically, yeah. you know, mentally, or well-being. Yeah, yeah. Um. And when she talked about resentment, and we're still in chapter one, mm-hmm. she says, when we're resentful, we do things out of obligation to others instead of for the joy of helping. Mm-hmm. So I thought that that was very helpful because you want to be, when you help somebody, you want to just do it just because, not so much of you owe me or there's something on the back end. Yeah. You know, I think yeah. that's common. I, I think I do that myself a lot. Yeah. And being resentful sucks. It does. You know? I feel like it builds though. Mm-hmm. Like, and I don't even know if you know that you're being resentful. Like, because it just builds because you have so much stuff building, people do, you know, doing stuff to you and just holding all that stuff in and instead of expressing it and then you end up presenting this person. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Overtime. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's like 
the very first time I meet you, I'm presenting you. It's like this is been building. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, I feel you got some good ones. Mm-hmm. What else? Yeah. Then on page nine, mm-hmm. she says a boundary is a cue to others about how to treat you. Yep. That's real. Yeah. And I always say in order you have to show others how to treat you by the way you treat yourself. Oh. So yeah. yes. Yeah. Same yeah. <laughs> so for the, the people in the back. I don't think it's anybody behind it. <laughs> uh yeah. So this says, um, I'm going to show you how to treat me by the way I treat myself. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So I think that's the point. So sometimes you have to ask yourself. If someone is mistreating you, how are you treating yourself? Mm, like you, good. you have to show people. Yeah. You know, some people say, "Before you came in my life, I was doing this, and then you came into my life, and now I don't even know who I am." <laughs> yeah. Then she says, "Our family histories and personalities determine how we implement and accept boundaries." If your family operates on unspoken limits or regularly ignores limits, you will probably grow up lacking the communication skills necessary to be assertive about your needs. So, yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to family history. Mm-hmm. And, and then the personalities, like, you know, if you deal with somebody who has uh eggshell personality, you have to mm-hmm. tip so on eggshells to talk to that person, it's going to be very hard to like articulate yourself and really get your needs met because it's like, oh, every time I say anything, they mm-hmm. go crazy or they get upset, or like you have a parent that you know doesn't allow you to express yourself, or mm-hmm. you know, you know, you have old school parents like I did. We didn't tell our parents nothing. There was no I feel like this or mm-hmm. I need this, like boo. You just have to accept whatever they say. You move on about your business. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. She says if your family operates on unspoken limits or regularly ignores limits, mm-hmm. you'll probably lo- grow up lacking the communication skills. So, yeah. and that, that's all facts. Yeah. Because um, I grew up like that too. Yeah. yeah. Um, you just did whatever yeah. mama, mama said. said you know. Whatever they said. Mm-hmm. You know, ask some questions. And even if it's something like you had going on anyway, like it's like, nope, you gotta go do this instead because you still have to. Yeah. Uh, chapter one, I had a whole bunch of stuff in chapter oh, one. Oh, that's okay, cool. Yeah. So, <laughs> and page 14 says most people on the top, mm-hmm. most people will understand that you're serious, which will help the people in your life become serious about your boundaries too. So, once you set them, on page 14. 14. And she says right here. No, I, I heard you. But honoring your boundaries through action is the only way. Most oh, I was trying to figure out what you were saying before that. Uh, but that that uh sentence before it said, but honoring your boundaries through action is the only way most people will understand that you're serious, mm-hmm. which will help people in your life become more uh, become serious about your boundaries too. Okay. Because I didn't I, I didn't catch uh, Okay. Mm-hmm. No, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And it goes back to the way you treat yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Then on 14, she says, common responses to boundaries. It's number one, pushback, limit setting, ignoring. Limit testing. Uh, limit testing. Yeah. Ignoring, rationalizing, and questioning, mm-hmm. defensiveness, ghosting, mm-hmm. silent treatment, acceptance. So those were the eight. Mm-hmm. Then on a pretty self-explanatory, uh, and and also in the comment section, if you have any questions, drop questions in the comment section, and we can answer them accordingly. If there's something that you saw on here or that you heard on here that can um, you probably want to discuss a little more in detail, leave a comment below. On page fifteen, the second paragraph, she says, "Pushback is a manifestation of the fear that things will be different." of being pushed out of the comfort zone. Mm. Even though different doesn't mean bad, some people will struggle to deal with new terms in a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Some people, I believe, and we always talk about this, we always talk about that dance, the dance that you have with, this is the way we do things. Mm-hmm. 
Like maybe so. And you get used to it. And once someone breaks the pattern, then somebody is forced to change. Yeah. And some people isn't good with change. I know. I can say every honest, I'm not good with change. <laughs> change. I don't like things that I've been comfortable with and been doing for a certain mm-hmm. way for years. And all of a sudden someone tries to come in and switch it up. I'm like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Stop it so mm-hmm. I'm one of those people I can admit to my laws in life <laughs> and she says uh i have things i need to but oh under pushback sounds like mm-hmm. yeah i have things i need to but i'm not making you change mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah so that's that whole defensiveness thing yeah 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 on page 17 on the mm-hmm. top of the paragraph she says if she's too scared to restate her boundaries, she'll likely end up. Oh, well, that <clears throat> this was based on a story that I yeah. highlighted. So okay. you'll have to, yeah. So you'll have to read the book to understand what I'm talking about because you wouldn't understand if I just said it. Yeah. <laughs> but it was according to a story in a book. Uh, then on the bottom of the page, she says, Remember that people benefit from you not having limits. Oh, say it out. Yeah. Because when you don't have them, people can just they people always come to you whenever they need stuff, or it's just like, oh no, Clarissa's good. Let me go and see what she got going on. You know? Crazy, crazy. Yeah, because people like your time. You know, even on social media, if I get an inbox, people just love your time. Mm. And, you know, you 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 answer a question or two. You know, and. Sometimes people, they just want all of your time and you can't give everybody that same amount of time. Mm-hmm. Like Everybody has to be respectful of other, other people's time. So yeah. um, I think that's that's important to you. Uh, page 18, to how to handle rationalizing, rationalizing or oh, questioning. Mm-hmm. Just be careful to not explain yourself. Keep your response short by saying something like, this is what's healthy for me. Saying too much will put you in the back and forth negotiation. I had that same thing highlighted. Mm-hmm. That's like, because it's like, you wonder like, okay, say I do start trying to set these boundaries, like, and they do, you know, be like, well, why you can't do that? Mm-hmm. And you can't do it for me just this once? And, you know, and it's like, because people are, you know, some people will do that to you, especially if this is something new for them when you've always said yes to things and all of a sudden you're saying no, mm-hmm. like they're going to question this. Like, so how do you handle that questioning? Do you, because me, I have a break. I'd be like, oh, okay, it's fine. I'm just doing it. Don't worry about it. Like, or it'd be like, I'll compromise when I go, I'll do it today, but I can't, you know, um, I'll find a way to still appease the person. So uh, saying that this is healthy for me, like, and doing the back, like she said, like saying too much will put you in a back and forth negotiation. I'm always in the back and forth negotiation. A lot of times, like I negotiate. And there's times where I don't even have to and I end up putting myself there. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like they didn't even question me. I'm like, oh, well, I can do this. Yeah. And, you know, so mm-hmm. get that. You know? uh, anything else? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Chapter one. Okay, so that was chapter one for what I had. So okay, well, I think I only back. had a couple of things that you didn't have highlighted. Um, on page thirteen, I had people cannot accurately assume your boundaries based on your body. Oh, you did say that. Oh, did you? No, I didn't. Oh, people cannot accurately assume your boundaries based on your body language and unspoken expectations. When you explicitly state what you expect, there is little room for others to misinterpret what works for you. Um, I think that was big for me because, like I said, I expect people to assume what I'm saying based off Mm -hmm. of my body language or how I'm acting. Like, you should know because I'm obviously giving him the cold shoulder, so Mm -hmm. you should know I'm upset about this, but instead of I need to start stating and I I have started stating mm-hmm. what you know I need from you mm-hmm. let's say and that way you're not misinterpreting it because you might assume that I was mad about something I was totally not mad about mm-hmm. so um on page 17 where it said how to handle ignoring um it says restate your boundary request that the other person repeat it back what you stated um I 
uh, what I think that's something that I even try not to do with the children is ignoring them because I can feel myself doing that. Mm. And then, like even my mom, she used to do it when we were younger. She would sit there and ignore us, and you it just irks your soul when you're trying to talk to a person and they're completely ignoring yeah. <laughs> you. And it's just like, wait, you're not gonna listen to me. Yeah, wait, and so when we were growing up, you know, we got used to the ignoring. If I'm on the way, I should you just ignore you and move on about our business. So, you know, you got, you get used to that kind of behavior, mm. you know, and I don't even find myself doing it to the children. <laughs> now I just ignore them. I was like, I've already told you I'm not going to do this. So I'm just ignore you. <laughs> you know, and it's just like, looking at that, I'm like, oh, this is not healthy. Mm. <laughs> you That's know, cool. so, it's, yeah. Mm. Uh... I had the same thing you highlighted on there. And I think the only other thing I had was on 22, uh, where it says family, um, where it says, but parents should respect the limits and needs of their children, even when they are young. It's okay for a small child to set limits like not eating uh, meat or feeling um, uncomfortable around certain people. Parents who respect those boundaries make space for their children to be, feel safe and loved, and they reinforce the positive habit of articulating needs. Now that I am a parent, mm -hmm. I realize that's something that I would like to implement with our children more often. I mean, I feel like we're working on it now, but I, we weren't given that space when we were growing mm -hmm. up, you know, there's a, even, I have to even catch myself now, like when the kids see somebody, I'm like, hey, go, go give them a hug, like, yeah. you know, forever, or, you yeah. know, go and, and it's just like, if they don't feel comfortable hugging that person, they don't have to hug them, you know, and that's okay. And, um, or like the kids are the pickiest eaters in the world. Pickiest eaters. But like giving them that space, like, you know, I really don't like meat. I don't want to eat that anymore. And that's why, like, even today, Jeremiah, he, <laughs> I put chicken inside of his quesadilla. Mm -hmm. And I, he said, I don't like chicken. And I was like, since when? Yeah, right. But the other half of me was like, you know what? I'm going to put it on half. If you really, truly do not like chicken in your quesadilla, and you eat it today, and you just decide that it's something that you don't want, and you really don't like it then you'll never have to eat the chicken in the case he is again but i want you to still like try it and make sure that she really don't like it you right. know but i only put it on half so he still had the option they only have to cheese in this case it is. but it's like he still needs his protein you know so i was like let me make sure he this is something he really doesn't like and he said he really doesn't like it so i was like okay i'll accept that and i'll let him have that boundary um but I don't think when we were growing up that we had that space to have boundaries at all. And I just realized now, I was like, that sounds unhealthy. And granted, our parents didn't know because they weren't given boundaries. So they're only doing the things that they learned, you know? So it's like, I feel like I don't want that for our children. Yeah. I want them to have, be able to have boundaries and enforce them and then be able to articulate their needs. Like be able to tell us like, hey, I really, I feel really uncomfortable about this and I really don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel really unsafe right now. I feel better. And then, you know, we can help them to find ways for them to feel safe and, you know, give them, let them come up with that process of feeling safe and yeah. feeling comfortable and how they can do things because, you know, we live in this world where you're going to feel that way all mm -hmm. the time. So, you know, helping them find ways to make themselves comfortable in an uncomfortable situation mm -hmm. and letting them figure it out for themselves. Cause mama and daddy are not going to always be there to figure it out. So I feel like by them articulating themselves and learning how to advocate for themselves early, it's going to be healthy for them mm -hmm. uh, because I can think of so many adults who to this day don't articulate themselves or are not able to uh, are, uh, advocate for themselves mm -hmm. for the things they want. They just take shit all the time. Mm -hmm. Excuse my language, but for like, <laughs> mm -hmm. they, they just take it. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think that's all I have on um, chapter one. Chapter one. What did you have on chapter two? So we're going to go into chapter two right now. And chapter two is the cost of not having healthy boundaries. And she quotes Brene Brown by saying, choosing discomfort over resentment. Mm. Uh, big fan of Brene Brown works. So we read we read one of Brene Brown books. Mm -hmm. I think of the gift, the gifts of imperfection, I believe. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, but we read that book together. Yeah, um, chapter two. Let me see what did I have on um, chapter two on page 35. 
she says, first, let's take a closer look at anxiety. It is often triggered by setting unrealistic expectations, the inability to say no, people pleasing, and the inability to be assertive. When people come to me with anxiety, we begin to dissect the different aspects of their lives and to work on ways to minimize triggers that cause them to become anxious. Mm. Based on my experience with clients, the biggest trigger for anxiety is the inability to say no. Mm. So many, so helping people with anxiety means assisting them in setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. then, then she says, so setting a limit about what we what we're really able and willing to do is one way to manage anxiety triggers. Unrealistic expectations of yourself and others also can trigger anxiety. Mm -hmm. So, I, I yeah, I think the unreal, unrealistic expectations. Yeah, I struggle with that too. Mm -hmm. I have so many crazy expectations of myself. Oh, um, of yourself. Oh. Yeah, because she says unrealistic expectations of yourself yeah. and others. I'm the others. Mm -hmm. I have unrealistic expectations. Oh, for, for oh, okay, yeah. Basically, of you. Oh, yeah. I guess because I'm just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I guess. Uh, thank you. Um, but she talked about the anxiety triggers, uh, inability to say no, and people pleasing. So I think those are really good. I think a lot of people struggle with that. Oh yeah, for sure. The inability to say no. And no is a is a complete sentence. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you those that are complete sentences. Yeah, it's... But, so that's what I had on page 35. 36, I had... Uh, she has some bullet points. Who's standard? For 36 on chapter 2. To determine if your expectations are reasonable, consider this. Okay, and those are the bullet points. I had to highlight it. Mm -hmm. Who's standard am I trying to meet? Do I have time to commit to this? Mm -hmm. What's the worst thing that can happen if I don't do this? I mm -hmm. think that was good. If I say no, they'll say I'm being selfish and abandon me, for mm -hmm. example. And uh, then she says, after I set limits, people will remain in a relationship with me. I think oh, that was under the affirmations for people who struggle with anxiety. Mm -hmm. I had that. I had that whole oh, section highlighted. Yeah. I'm entitled to have the expectations and healthy relationships. My desires will be acknowledged and accepted. After I set limits, people remain in a relationship with me. Mm -hmm. I can set standards, even though, even through my discomfort. Mm -hmm. Those are affirmations for people who struggle with anxiety. Those mm -hmm. are things you could say. Yeah, I thought those were. Yeah, those are good. Those are good. Mm -hmm. Then before we move on to the next page, I'm gonna forget. Oh. I had on page 37 the bullet parents under examples of less harmful boundaries. Um, accepting assistance to your car at the grocery store, correcting people when they say your name wrong, asking for help while shopping instead of trying to find merchandise on your own, and asking questions instead of assuming you know the answer. Those are examples of those are examples of less harmful boundaries. Mm -hmm. Just that, so I thought those were good too. So I had to highlight it on that page. Yeah, yeah, and that's even like if I'm in a grocery store or whatever. Like if I can help somebody with something, I, I'll take them there instead of just showing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's good because there's so many times when people are like, oh, uh, like I. I realized he didn't work there today. He was a brand man. Mm -hmm. I realized he didn't work for Walmart. So when I finally saw his shirt, I was like, where are the 30th? I need some of these 30th. Mm -hmm. And he was like, uh, they're on the next aisle. And I was like, okay. And, but the other guy who was working the same aisle, who was also a bread guy, he was like, oh, they're on this aisle next to this. And he gave me really specific mm -hmm. answers, even started like kind of walking with me. And I I, I appreciated that extra. Mm -hmm. Just even though he didn't technically work for Walmart or whatever, mm -hmm. but like, he knew where it, where it was, so him, you know, showing me. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. Yeah. On page thirty nine, mm -hmm. she says, and like she says in chapter six, mm -hmm. um, but know that if you haven't told someone what yours are, as boundaries, they can't possibly know. Oh, where it says, I will show you how to communicate boundaries clearly, but right. know that if you haven't told someone what yours are, they can't possibly know. Okay. Mm -hmm. People can't meet a standard that we never express. And we talked about that earlier. Boundaries are not unspoken rules. Unspoken boundaries are inevitable and they often sound like they should <laughs> they should have known better 
or a common sense will say, I know I'm guilty of that. I'm, I be, I'm thinking everybody have common sense. And, and common you know, sense it, ain't so common. Yeah. And people, uh, this next thing that you're going to say is good. I had to highlight it too. Mm. Where it says common sense is based on our life experiences. However, and it isn't the same for everyone. That's why it's essential to communicate and not assume that people are aware of our expectations and relationships. We must inform others of our limits and take responsibility for upholding them. Mm. I had the same thing how that she did. Like mm. that's really good because I had to tell myself everybody's perspective in life is different. Like we're all, you know, because we expect people to see stuff from our perspective, mm. but like we lived two different lives before we got to each other. Mm. So down to like how we put up silverware and how mm. we dry the dishes, like. I put it in the dishwasher because that's what Jamaicans do. We put everything in the dishwasher to dry. But you use a, a dish rack, you know? So, and I'm sitting here like, why don't you just put it in the dishwasher? Then? But he was like, dishwasher is to wash dishes, you know? So, mm-hmm. like, we, but we, that's, and I had common sense then to put it in there, you know what I'm saying? But common sense is not the same for both of us. Our perspectives are different. So, I thought that was really good. Yeah. And they should have known better. Like, <laughs> They should have known, like, based on your assumption. Right. Like, you should know that you're not supposed to do this in front of this person. And it's like, well, who are they? If they never had that experience, they wouldn't. Mm-hmm. And she says, simply put, relationships without boundaries are dysfunctional. And that's on page 39. Mm-hmm. Unreasonable and hard to manage. They operate mostly, they operate mostly based on the assumption that something magical will happen to turn out, to turn it all around. But hoping that our relationships will repair themselves out of nowhere is a long shot at best. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I think most people aren't willing to do the work. I think mm-hmm. people want they want the relationships. Like people, some people they want what you have, but they don't want to do what you did to get it. Because yeah. they don't know all the pain and heartache and yeah. grind you had to do to get there. Sleepless nights. Mm-hmm. That's a lot. Yeah, so you would tell them certain stuff. You tell people like, "Okay, do this, 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 and this," and they be like, "Oh yeah, that's cool," but <laughs> and just like, "Okay," and that's then and then they they sending you a DM to, three months later with the same issue, and I'm like, "Well, did you follow through?" You know, so you gotta. I thought I was with my friend the other day. Like, if someone's actually taking you know your advice, it's a lot easier for you to. You know, have people tell you things. It's like they listen to what I'm telling them. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I get. Yeah, and those are the people you don't mind sewing into because mm-hmm. they won't listen. Mm-hmm. And then on page forty, she says they believe that their self care is at the expense of being there for another person. That is referring to without boundaries in relationships, we also can't have healthy self-care practices. In fact, most people without healthy limits think that engaging in self-care is selfish. So it feels terrible when they try to do it. They believe that their self-care is at the expense of being there. Their self-care is at the expense of being there for another person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, self-care brings up feelings of guilt because they feel like others will fall apart without their help Mm. in these kinds of relationships our role is that of a helper we worry about the other person and don't trust that they can care for themselves unless we enable them so yes that's see i have to do everything for everybody because it's like I don't do it. It's not going to get done. Mm-hmm. Or he has to have me here. Especially like dealing with elderly parents yeah. and stuff like that. That's you kind of a different monster though. Too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. But you feel like you have to be there like at every single little thing because it's like that world's going to fall apart if I'm not in it. And a lot of times we be enabling them to not do stuff and they can perfectly do it on their own if they had to, but mm-hmm. we're enabling them not to because it's like, oh, I know Clarissa will do it or I know mm-hmm. my son will do yeah. it. You know, it's like, yeah, by default there too. Okay. I think that's most of us, right? You know, somebody do something to do it for you. You're like, oh, why? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, then on page 40, she says, when we do become clear about our expectations, saying, I need you to fill in a blank, we at least learn exactly who who is and who isn't willing to honor what we need and want. Mm. In your relationships, are people clear about how you desire to be treated? 
how are you how are you treating yourself others learn we talked about that before too right <laughs> others learn a lot about you from watching how you treat yourself mm -hmm. people can sense a lack of self-esteem and neediness based on how you talk to yourself talk about yourself and treat yourself behaviorally to be kind to yourself uh to be kind to yourself because the people in your life are watching this doesn't mean that people have a right to be mean i had that too mm -hmm. that was good yeah that's good because and this is i learned over time be careful how you talk to yourself to other people mm. because exactly. when you when you point out your flaws or when you be like I suck at this, or I'm so stupid, or I'm so clumsy. People yeah, pick up right, on that. Like, oh, you must be stupid. Yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if you're talking out, if you're talking like that out loud, I only can imagine what you're saying yourself yeah, on the yeah, inside. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, page forty-two, which we talked about frustration. Mm -hmm. She says, "When we feel frustrated after making our expectations known, we will say things like." Well, they won't listen anyway, or I already tried that and it didn't work. Frustration leads to a loss of hope and motivation. That is totally me. Like, if I I don't like rejection <laughs> or not getting the the uh, the outcome that I mm -hmm. want, and so I, if I don't get the outcome that I'm looking for, I immediately get pressure and I'm like, okay, I quit. I'm not going to do it anymore <laughs> because um, you're not going to have me all oh, frustrated and I end up being frustrated anyway because I'm gonna do what I need it. So <laughs> yeah. That's real. Yeah. Um then she talked about complaints. Mm. Um, however, with complaining, we usually play the the role of victim, saying things like, Why does everyone expect so much from me? My husband knows I need help, but he doesn't offer. I don't understand why people can't do things for themselves. Uh, she says <laughs> she says we don't stop to evaluate what we're allowing to happen by not setting clear boundaries oh i had that part highlighted too i actually highlighted the whole paragraph mm. along with not being a solution complaining much like gossiping builds resentment as we air out our grievances we become more frustrated and annoyed reinforcing the belief that others are doing things to us we don't stop to evaluate that we're allowing to have what we are allowing to happen by not setting clear boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was good. I had that whole paragraph. Mm -hmm. I like it. It's true. That's me. I do that a lot of times because I'll be setting clear boundaries. On well, 45, she says, after a few weeks, I was, I couldn't take it anymore. When he called, I said, oh, well, and then that's part of the story too. That's yeah, part of the story. Yeah, yeah, so on page 45, yeah, so if you are reading the book, that's part of a story, so we'll have to read that um so in chapter two was there anything that stood out to you maybe that we didn't have highlighted together no um i actually everything very the stuff that i i, I called it out when you were reading because mm -hmm. we have a lot of stuff highlighted mm -hmm. so yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay yeah. well that was chapter two is so much good content mm -hmm. it's a really good book i've enjoyed it so far and it's already helped me to try to set better boundaries in my life and in my relationships and you know not only with just like relationship between us but family mm -hmm. friends uh my children mm -hmm. you know it's it's really helped to just help me make better decisions and like really Letting me have a happy place yeah. and, you know, thinking about my emotional well-being a lot more because I was the person, Sean would tell me, he said, you'll set your own fire, yourself on fire to make everybody else warm. And I'm mm -hmm. like, dang, that's deep. Mm -hmm. Who said that? And then Yeah. That was deep. Yeah. But, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, I realized that I was doing that because I had no problem being uncomfortable so that everybody else could be good. And mm -hmm. that's not healthy. Yeah, yeah, because you can do all you can for other people, and it still won't be happy. After you even wore yourself out trying to please people, they still <laughs> they still talk about you. Yeah, but it's true. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been an awesome uh, episode of Bedroom Chronicle. Bedroom Chronicle, you call it? Bedroom Chronicle. <laughs>
<laughs> you should call it Bay Chronicles. Bay, Bay Chronicles book. Bay bedroom. Bay, Bay books. Bay, 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 Bay's, Bay's <laughs> books. Books with Bay. Books with Bay. Yeah. Books with Bay. So in the comment section, let me know what you think would sound good. So I don't know. We'll we'll roll something. Bedroom Chronicles, Volume One. Books with Bay. <laughs> yeah. So that that's a challenge this year. I want I want to see couples play more intimacy through books and reading. So who knows? You know, somebody might get lucky tonight. Who knows? After getting a little intimacy, you know. That's his way of saying he needs to get lucky tonight. Yeah. What's that song? Get lucky. I wonder. Is that for real song? Say oh, hope all night to get lucky. Oh. All night to get lucky. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So pick up the book. Leave a comment below and also pick up a copy for you and your significant other if you are struggling in this area or maybe, you know, this is something that you need to use as a refresher for your own personal life. Yeah. So thanks again, everyone, for watching. We will see y'all in the air room again next week. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks again for watching another segment of A Scary to Remarry. I have so much more amazing content and some phenomenal guests as well. People who've been through a divorce, people who remarry, people who desire to marry. So much great content. So make sure that you hit one of these videos. It's somewhere around here. But anyway, go watch another video. Thank you.